So I came in England 10 years ago. My main focus was just my children. I was homeschooling them. I was an active member of the community. I was a teacher in Madrasa. Life was quite normal, peaceful, until I experienced within six months two raids in the very early hours in the morning. I just came home and I had a knock on the door, which was quite strong. So I looked through the window and I saw I was worried that the door was going to be broken. So I ran to the door and I opened it. Once I opened it, I ran trying to find my hijab and I couldn't find it. But before that happened, I got grabbed from the back and told that I was arrested. It was really, really shocking. I could not comprehend what exactly was going on. In the same time, I looked to her, I looked to her side and they were my two children holding to each other and looking at me. And the other side, uh, my other sister, none of them with the hijab, all the girls terrified. I did not understand what was going on. I felt really very confused and I knew that this is serious. I could not understand why. Why me? Why my children? And I just called upon Allah. I felt that I, at that time, I really belonged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I, I said to Allah, I belong and to him we should return. It was a really tough time as a mother. I would say, more than anything else, I couldn't stand on my feet. I asked if I could sit down, would they let me? And then I took my children, I called them, I put one on one on one knee and the other on the other knees. I tried to explain to them that mom is going to go now, but she's coming very soon, that I have to go and help these people, but I promise I will come back. Because for my understanding, I would come back, which I did not. It's like I left to part of me, leaving that door for a mother, well, it's not easy. On top of that, not knowing where I'm going was neither easy. I tried to stay really positive. And uh, I asked Allah, I said, Allah, I said, Allah, whatever I have left behind me, I give it to you. I went to the car, handcuffed, confused. I had to believe firmly that this is going to end very soon, not knowing that my whole inside was trembling. Everybody was insignificant for me. The only thing that existed at that time is, is my children and what's going to happen and where am I going? The youngest, most impacted, um, she was four years old and the youngest was seven. I still remember the whole look, her eyes looking at me. My children, they, they did not comprehend and they believed that I would come back, and I, I didn't. And till today, my, my youngest, she said, Mom, I believed you were coming back after three days. Why didn't they let you come back? It's for my understanding, oh, okay, the maximum that I would stay in custody is three days. I'm coming back home. I haven't done anything. I'm a mother. I work for my children. I homeschool them. I take care of them. And it stops, it stops there. So till today, I have a picture of my, of my daughter who comes back so often. Her, her look, just like when I left, I, I didn't want to look behind me. I didn't want, I just said, Ya Allah, please use the most powerful here. And this is the first thing I did is I looked out the side. Where are my children? Are they seeing this? And I saw the small one grabbing her eldest daughter, sister and their eyes were frightened. I think they don't have any fault for what is going on and they shouldn't be put through this. It should not, because the, the, the lasting impact is, is still here. So basically, my sister was with my little children, and it was really late, about midnight, and they said to them, you know, just go now. But my sister said, well, where do we go? They can't take their coats, they can't take their shoes, they can't take anything, everything that needs to be left. They just had to live with the sandals. And my sister, she said, but we, we don't have, we don't have a car. We have nothing. How are we going to go? So my sister said, I'm going to start screaming here if you just leave us like this in the middle of the night with two, two frightened children. They dropped them by the car to my mother. And there, another shock for my mother, which is seeing my, her, her two grandchildren and my sister in a very, very distressed state. We never returned home. That home that they entered, we never went back to it. My life got shattered. I lost my home because I had to stay in prison. My family cannot afford at that time for the rent. 
So my mom should just give up the home. My family had to go through through so much stress, including that I had to give away all my stuff. Oh, they just needed to give them away because it was so much things to do, so much things to. They were they had to they had to to manage everything on their own, and they did not speak English. It was too much for them. So me hearing about losing losing my my home was was like okay, this is the start. She was completely confused and she was really worried about where I am what's going to happen she didn't know where I was and she did not have any contact to inquire so sitting myself sitting in the custody I was going through all this I was going through every single person of my family's emotion I was handling it all the day I was like my mom what, what, what's going to happen to her my children how are they are they crying what what is going on so it was already my own the stress that is related to myself but then as well as, as my family and I for her is the same she does not know what's going on with me and why is, is this sudden you don't know whether are your loved ones you don't know what's happening with them I was not allowed to speak to my children can you imagine for me not being able to speak to them for two days they could not hear about their mother or my mom hearing about me or my family and they don't know where I am we had to ask the court because police were not allowing that and for me just to hear my children's voice and to reassure them and to reassure my mom that mom i'm okay that's all i needed to say i did not need to say anything else just to reassure them and i think it's more than it's just a human needs but i was not allowed alhamdulillah we are alhamdulillah we are believers and we know that we belong only to him and that anything that befalls us is by him and for him they locked me in in the custody and i just i knew that i needed just to put my head on the floor nothing else could alleviate that pain that i was going through being ripped for my children was something that is still today i feel i feel it as as a, as a physical rip not only an emotional one and i i just had to to bow on the floor and ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to to help me go through this difficult moments because I knew that there are difficult days coming. I would say that prayer and patience and hope that what got me through this horrific and forgettable moment of my life. It was just so confusing and shocking that how I am ending up in such a place. And I think my brain just could not manage it. I was given a lot of information at that time by the officers. One of the information that was quite really shocking is that I, you may be in risk of being beaten up in here. My body failed me. My body literally failed me. And I remember they put me into a health center at that time because my body just could not. I slept for, for about 48 hours. I can't remember exactly what was going on, but I have flashbacks that I would just wake up and pray without even making my wudu. So I could not even get up and eat water to make my wudu. That's how my body failed me. And I just remember getting up, praying there, just like I am, with my closed eyes and being really unconscious. unconscious. Where, am, where am I? What's going on? What is this? Why is my body like that? And I just pray and go back. And I did that for about 48 hours. Until I, I think my my brain just restarted and my body restarted to, to give me. But I could not, basically, I could not connect to anything around me. And I could not comprehend that. I was shocked. My body just got so frightened. I, I, I just could not comprehend why would I be in a prison, first of all. And on top of that, being told that I'm going to be beaten up. So my body at that time just failed me completely. I remember vomiting very heavily, so I could not hold anything in. And that was that was really shocking for me. And I stayed in that state uh, for two days and cleaned. And I could not even share that with, um, with the nurse. So they put me into a healthcare unit for, for, that, for that two days. And I was completely disconnected from the world. Completely disconnected from everything around me. And I just slept for 48 hours. I did not know the time. I didn't know if it was Dohar, Hasar, Maghrib, Aisha. I would just woke up instinctly and not being even, uh, even able to reach water to do my wudu. So I would just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me and give me strength. And I still prayed. And I don't know what I was saying, what I was praying. I lost completely the sense of time, of place, of needs. I lost 
I lost the meaning of, of being, I think. Till today, I remember myself in that bed, sleeping 48 hours, opening my eyes, not being able to reach anything, very thirsty, just trying to, to get up and get some water, and I was unable to do that. I remember still till today, my thirst, my hunger, and the fact that I, I couldn't even hold myself, just like a little child, a, list, a lost little child. So I, I do remember this specific moment of my life of my prison time. It was like I was in a coma state, basically, when I'm trying to, again, you know, try to find anything that would just make me grounded, basically. I needed to feel grounded. I needed to feel somewhere. And there was nothing that I could belong to. It was really hard. I wouldn't say it was a dream, but it was, like, unreal. And once I went into my room, I looked around, and again, I could not, I could not cope with the reality that was there. I closed the door and I said, Oh Allah, if you put me through here, knowing that I am innocent and knowing that I haven't done anything, there must be a reason. Please show me that reason. And I remember I needed air and I just looked up around and that window, basically, it has like a few little air. I stuck my face to, to that window just to have some air and I, I just couldn't have that. And I really needed it. Allah, and I just went complain again and I said Ya Allah please I know these days are not going to be easy and just be by my side and again help me understand why I am here and I slept again for another 24 hours and they kept coming chicken on me I did not eat and I remember waking up in the morning in the middle of the night um I just drank from from the sink and then I started feeling like okay I'm a bit alive it was night so I felt more secure because the door was closed and Nobody can harm me, nobody can, can hurt me. And I just started to pray. And it was the beginning of uh, another journey. The pain that would my heart carry was so unbearable at times that I would just disconnect from the reality and just connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help ease that pain, just like he eased the pain of the mother of Musa alayhi salam. So you don't have friends around to speak to, families, or you can't even really call that much and speak. So you find yourself in, in, a, in a cell with a lot of emotions. Once you're locked in, that all, it, it needs to get out, that pain. I, I need to cry and cry and cry and, and think just how far they are, how good are they, how are they dealing with the pain themselves. I used to imagine them, like picture them, visualize it. And that was causing me a lot of, of distress. But as a believer, there's always something left for us to ponder about and uh, to hold on. A lot of patience, a lot of, of duas. I was basically asking Ya Allah, just like you, you eased the pain of the mother of Musa alayhi salam, just please Ya Allah, help me with this because it's, 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 it's something that I cannot help it and nobody can help me with it and it's just too much because the most precious thing that we can break is it's, it's a mother from her child that union between her and her child it's precious and it's priceless i remember crying all of us as mothers over there for ramadan it was really difficult to be away from my children and i was helpless because i wish i could do something for them but you can't you can't physically be there you can't alleviate the pain. You can't do much about it. They cried. They cried really much. And the whole family basically cried. It wasn't a Eid. It's not Eid without the loved ones around. So they missed my presence in all ways. It was a really painful time for me as a mother to be away from them in such a blissful day. So I would just imagine and visualize and could go through that pain and accept it and and hope for the better. My mom and sister came and my children were not allowed. A court order from the social services. That was for me a trembling time. I, 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 when I saw my mom and my sister came, come in and my children were not there, I just froze. Mother, all I wanted is my children. All I wanted is just to see them, just to hold them, to hug them, to reassure them, and to tell them I'm still there. Even if I'm far, I'm still there. And I'm with them with all my being. That didn't happen and it shook me really, really much. So I could only see them a few weeks after my arrest. And that just, I don't know how I, I just, I don't know how I made it. It's like, you know, visitor, visit room, not the best environment for a child to be, uh, not the best vibes. And they expressed how 
happy they were, but how terrifying that was to go through all the security checks, seeing all the prisoners around. It was like a new world for them. And as, as, as children, it was damaging, but they had a lot of anxiety to, to go through all these checks and, and uh, waiting for when is the next time we're going to be able to see mom. And basically that children, their needs are, okay, I need to see mom now. I need mom now. And uh, I don't want to have mom in two weeks. I, I want her at this time. I need her. And, and that's it. It stops there for a child. The emotions were su suppressed, pushed to test. And again, no child deserves to go through that. The only why, it was why didn't they let you come back? You told us you're going to come back. And you were sure about it. And I was. I was sure because I haven't done anything. So why would I go to prison? So they, they were like, why did they not keep their promise? Why, why did they let you come back? But this had a lot of impact on the youngest because she, not, she could not comprehend the times. And she would just count every day, count and count and count and count. And then she was like, Mom, it's been 42 days and you didn't come back here, Mom. Why? 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 Tell them to just let you go. The innocence of a child. And that, for me, was, I would just crumble in behind the phone. It was just so hard to deal with my own emotion and to try to reassure her that oh, it's going to be fine. As you can imagine, children knowing, seeing their mother taken away in front of their eyes, on top of that, not knowing how does the prison look like, how mom's is sleeping, how is she eating, who is around her, who is she talking to? What is she doing? All these questions my children were, were to ask my, my sister and my mother. What is mom doing now? Why is she not calling now? When are we going to speak to her? When are we going to see her? It, it was too challenging mentally for my children. It, they, could not, they could not see where, where, where mom is and they would try to imagine. I think it's really traumatizing for the children. My, my youngest one is the one who really suffered more. She would have every night just grabbing her older sister and just cry, 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 cry. And just basically, she just wants her mother. And the eldest being brave enough to reassure her that mom will be back. And my kids just had to, to learn ways how to cope. The impact is still here. I still see it in my children. And they they speak about it with me and how they were scared that children, like all the students will know about it. What's going to happen now? Are we going to be bullied? It's not for a child war to go through that. It's not. It's traumatizing mentally, emotionally, and even physically because my, my youngest developed anxiety. She wouldn't eat in the morning. Until today, she does not eat in the morning. Till today, she has fears she, she says mom sometimes when you're outside i'm worried i'm worried I, i'm asking myself is she mom gonna come back or no she's she's a grown-up girl but still she has this flashbacks of how painful that thing was but let's say if someone knocks on the door they run to me, towards me they panic and i have to reassure them that it's just a knock nothing's gonna happen ever again i really try to reassure them and that on itself it panics me so I, I i start panicking and then i'm dealing with my own flashback and it just it's just so heavy my youngest if she sees the police outside she grabs me she's like mommy you're here you're not going anywhere so they have these flashbacks with them when they see police and sometimes it's just they, they question like would that ever happen again it's the fear of of something that was not expected to again unexpectedly happen living in that uncertain uncertainty and living with these fears does affect the way a child should live the safety the the security and the reassurance it's in this right of of, of every child and my, my children are missing this part of of their childhood A lot of people in the community turned their back to to my family, especially who were in need of support. I was expecting I was expecting people to to reach out, but they didn't. So we just know who were our real friends and who weren't. When my mom, she was so brave to be able to carry all this, and I thank her for today. Up till up today, it's not an easy. It was not an easy moment for her because she had to to walk extra. Um, to handle my daughter's emotional needs at that moment. She was trying to make sure that they're fine, that they don't miss their mother, uh, which is, of course, impossible, but she was trying to do her best to manage all this on top of her emotional distress and, and worries. She had to put a smile, but her health 
got really affected by that and she suffered a lot there's a deep a deep scar in my mom's soul i i are you, are you strong enough to be able to handle this and i assured her that i i will when i saw her the first time after i got i got arrested i could feel in her arms the pain that she was handling it's an emotional and physical and health ways financial struggle everything fall upon upon her in once all in once that was difficult because she has her own children she had her own life and on top of that you know following my case uh, solicitors uh, translators schools social services it was just too too much for my sister when she was after prison she was telling me how my, how my, her mom would just crumble she would just just be paralyzed emotionally and mentally and just not be able to to even speak but at the same time she had to be really brave and strong for for, for my children after being arrested that they had to attend school as a request from the social services which my mom did and then they had to pay for that schools and to pay for everything that it has to do with the schools even for the clothing so it was quite a lot of, of financial of loads on her on top of the emotional struggle that she was going with By the end of my of my period in prison, it got it got a bit more harder, and I knew at that time that the easy is coming because when it gets really hard, then we know that the easy is just behind the door. Once you are in there and completely excluded from the outside world, you you lose touch with some part of yourself, um, and you lose touch with some part of the world as well. So in in order to reconnect, it's not an easy it's not an easy phase. I was really 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 happy. Just the first thing that come into my mind was my children. I will go to my children and the mom is going back. My promise, I promise them to come back and I'm going back. I could see the light again. However, when I was walking towards the doors that would lead me to my freedom, I had I had a very hard moment to realize that it's actually happening. I think again, my brain just could not understand that. It's it, it, it just too much transitions and too shocking transition from one to another. I was thinking, where where am I going now? I have no no money. I couldn't go to my family, so that was one of the conditions. Um, I could not go into my into the town that I used to live in. <laughs> I had a tag, so I left the prison. It was quite an emotional emotion emotional moment, but with mixed mixed emotion, happy and and anxious. Where am I going? What's going to happen now? It's like you completely forgot what's going on in, outside of the world. You just have to create another type of of, of life inside of prison. And you have to adapt to it and make make it possible to live. The most difficult part which I'm angry about is my motherhood. The part of my motherhood being ripped away and this moment being taken away from my children, I'm angry about it. It's, it's literally I felt ripped, like something is ripping away from me. And I struggled once I got my children back. For me, it was so much traumatic. I think I had just to cope with it because I had to fight, focus on the case on itself, the way to get back my children. Uh, so emotionally, I put that kind of aside. But once I got my children back, it was it was an inverse effect. And I would explain this such as what happened? Did I really lose my children? How did I cope with that? It's a pause in my motherhood. It was like a pause. But that pause had, for me, had no significant reason. So I felt difficult to reconnect back to being a mother. And that was only when I got them back. Being a mother, but being in prison, not allowed to to express that motherhood which I had inside, that was traumatizing. I was happy for them to see me free, of course, out of prison, but because we still had a lot of restric restrictions, social services, so it was still pressure around us. And my children wished that they could see me in a more natural way. It took a long time to rebuild that relationship with my children as it was before prison. When you leave prison, it's not the same anymore. I haven't experienced all this kind of, of trauma from them and from me. There, there, are, there, there are negative impact on, on mother-child relationship. The, the changes that I had to go through had impacted our my motherhood when it comes to educating them routine wise so there was a lot of things that you used to do before that we couldn't do anymore not in terms of authority because they, they you know they respect me and it's more loving as well than respecting so they love me really much they you know they i felt 
I felt the changes because of one year and a half away from mom. I didn't have my passport once I, I left prison, so I could not apply for most of the jobs because my ID was basically taken away. That was the only ID which I had. At the beginning, I was not working, but then I worked a little bit. I just couldn't, I just couldn't work and my kids being away, my whole life upside down. Um, and I felt like I had to start all over the, from the beginning. I felt really vulnerable after leaving prison. All the ways, like financially, emotionally, physically. Is anybody knowing me here? What are they going to do to me? Financially, how, how I'm going to support my myself, how I'm going to support my children. It took a long, a long, a long, long time. And for me, this year and a half had a, a, a hard impact on us till today. The first time we knew about hugs is when hugs themselves reached my uh, my family once I was arrested. It was for my family the light in that dark time, and they asked my family what kind of help do they need. They emotionally supported them very, very much. The love, the empathy, the time that they gave, the affection, the support. It was till today we speak about it in a very 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 beautiful way it, it was at that time a big positive part of their life i didn't reach with hugs until a few months after my release when i i couldn't pay the rent i was scared at that time of everything around me and and every step i needed to think about it 100 million times so i thought let me just not speak to anyone let me just not do anything and just try to work and focus on my children it was difficult for me to connect back to people but after six months I, I i could not pay my rent so then i reached to hugs and i said i need i need support now can you please help alhamdulillah you know with big hearts they did hear my call and they supported me with my rent that was my start being a family with hugs hugs is a is a pillar of a hold in my life together it's really a light in the darkness that i had all these years i don't think that of course allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's the one who bestow his blessing upon us but hugs without the support that they give me i wouldn't think i would have made it today here sit in front of you and being able to speak when i was in prison they helped them a lot with the visit transport gift to my children constant checking up on them emotionally reassurance a lot advice about the, the legal thing solicitors translation they helped with vouchers with winter support and that was for each member of my family and they till today they appreciate it so much it's more than a support it's it's the presence of somebody who who is there when nobody is there i had a key worker at the beginning when i left prison um very empathetic reassuring encouraging her part of of, of being there was very helpful alhamdulillah she would listen without judgment she would advise and and remind me of of the good things that are, are there so I felt that I could speak to someone whenever I felt, okay, this is too much. So alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm thankful for those who, who play a, an important role behind hugs and volunteer. Alhamdulillah, they offered me counseling sessions, which helped me to alleviate some of the distress and the symptoms that are ongoing. So alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Hugs played a significant role in, in, in where I am today. So Alhamdulillah, they could provide like, you know, furniture for my children, essential things. They provided me with technical, practical ways for me to, to go back to learning, to education. So they helped with like laptops. Well, after being released from prison, I, I, I was stagnant, I would say stuck, stuck for quite a long time, where I cannot see any, any, any further future. It's just day by day, and it's just really hard to just see further. After having experienced so much stress and so much trauma, and hugs is being there step by step by my side until I am able today to again do something, start to, to see a like career, a future. So they supported me with the funding my training, which will allow me to have a, a full time job, work in a, in a safe environment, and be able to provide for my children. It's significant difference in my life that they are making it's not only instant help it's it's a long-term help so by me being able to have a, to again go to education and w without hugs I, w I don't think that i would be able to do that we all <laughs> including the children look for aid gifts from help you know my children wait for that person to come 
and it's like even the happiness they get from it is more even than what they could get from the family members because it's something that it's that I've been having every single year and just the fact that someone is thinking about them and they don't know who it is and they haven't met them but they are there and thinking about them at this specific moment is priceless the the, the smile that I see on my children it's more than the smile I see from them getting gifts from other parts of the family. So as well, the Eid, the Eid meetings, the coffee mornings, that was really helpful for my family and my children to feel that they're not alone and that there are people like them as well who are going through the same situation and that are looked after, that are not forgotten, which is very important for everyone because we tend to, after such horrific events, we tend to isolate, we become fearful. There's a lot of isolation and, and pain going on and alhamdulillah, Hugs being there, it was really, really, really important. I think the fact that we share all the same pain, it's something that it's helping. And we see the smile on the face. Alhamdulillah, we all have that smile despite the struggle and uh, the ongoing stress that the families are facing. Uh, Alhamdulillah, there's still a place where we can where we can share our, our struggle, our pain, our happy times, our sad times. And I think it's important for the community to, to have that moment, especially the children. Hugs has open doors, open hearts. I personally wouldn't have been able to cope with all what was going on and all what is still going on because its impact is long lasting. We crumble often when we when we remember what we have gone through. So there are days where we have the courage to carry on, but days where we just come back and we, we don't think we can make it anymore. And a few times I have reached at, at hugs at this very vulnerable moment. It is important for people who have gone through this to know that they are not alone, that they have support. And without the, the support, I, I wouldn't be able to cope with it. Because I was, there's times where I could not walk. There, there are times when I could not see any changes. Alhamdulillah. Always hugs was there. By getting, we make a living. But by giving, we make lives. Hugs not only give, they make lives. And without that support, I don't know how homes and families who have been through similar tests have been able to, to stay as a family. There, it's not only about giving financial assistance. It's about, it's about wiping tears. It's about building hopes. It's building homes and it's building future generations that have been through these very difficult times. So, alhamdulillah, I want to thank on behalf of, of me and my family and my children, all the people behind her. And they are, often I think about, who are they? Who are these generous donators um, that are behind hugs and they are part of our du'as me my children my families i want them to know that we know about them and they are in our du'as we feel the the gratefulness of their presence alhamdulillah